Hi friends, uh, I'm Dr. Ajay Rora. So today we'll be discussing uh, the basics of uh, retinal lasers. The aim is to uh, make you understand what lasers are all about, clinical examples of lasers as we use them today, uh, a little bit about the history of lasers and what is the future of lasers. So as you know that uh, lasers have been used around the eye uh, they started off with treatments for the retina. Uh, the initial thing was of diabetic retinopathy. And then we have lasers for uh, corneal procedures, denticular procedures, iridectomy, and trabeculoplasty. So let's have a look at what lasers are all about. When you look at the normal light, it follows the Huygens wave theory. And you have different wavelengths. The peaks and troughs do not match with each other. If the same light is passed to a filter, you will have a monochromatic light, but the peaks and troughs do not match, so they are not in sync. If we have a situation where <clears throat> it's a monochromatic light and the peaks and troughs are identical, then this is known as the coherent light. And that is what is essential aspect of lasers. <clears throat> so laser acronym stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. How is it is produced? You have normally electrons in different orbitals, which you remember in the chemistry. When one electron moves from a lower orbital to a higher orbital, where it is not stable and it comes back to the lower orbital, it releases energy in form of a photon. Now, this process of release of energy in photon can be activated by a pump into a laser medium, and that could generate numerous uh, photons at the same time. So basically, a laser system will have a pump which is an external source of energy, you can see here, which acts on the laser medium. The laser medium historically was gaseous, which was argon and krypton laser. Then came in the tunable dye laser. And now we have the semiconductor laser. So this is the heart of a laser machine, is the engine of the laser machine, where the electrons uh, get pumped to the higher orbital, they fall down, release photons, and this process of going to a higher orbital and falling back, uh, when, it, when it involves the entire medium, it's called as a population inversion. When these electrons, they hit a mirror which is fully reflective on one side, on the other side, there is a small opening which allows the laser beam to be um, to exit the uh, cavity, and then the laser is activated and released from the system. The credit for uh, what we have today goes to Dr. Mehr Shukrat, who way back in his 40s experimented on his terrace to capture the solar energy and convert it into uh, a system to, so that he could photocoagulate the tissues. And I would advise you to read his, uh, uh, read his, read this article, which was written by him. He went on to make the Zeiss Xenon photocoagulator, and you can see these burns being done out uh, around a horseshoe tear. This subsequently moved on to a log three Clinetex Xenon arc photocoagulator. And I had the opportunity of using it while I was in Jipper Pondicherry. And uh, none other than Steve Charles made an endolaser probe attachment to the Loxy Clinitex Xenon Arc Photocoagulator, which was used. Now let's have a look at the tissue interaction of the lasers. It is absorbed by the retinal pigment epithelium and the melanin in the choroid. So what happens is, that once the laser beam is absorbed, there's a local rise of temperature and a coagulated necrosis, which leads to the effect of laser. 
Initially, the lasers that were used were blue light, 488 nanometers and 540 nanometers, but it was found that these laser beams were absorbed by the xanthophyll and hence were damaging to the macula. So they have been given up and we have lasers now in the green range, 532, 577 is the yellow laser and we have the dyed red laser that is 810 nanometers. We were very fortunate that the mother of all multicentric trials was the diabetic retinopathy study, which uh, answered a few questions. The questions that, that were asked were, does laser photocognition help to prevent severe visual loss in cases of PDR? Is there a difference in the efficacy and safety of argon versus xenon photocoagulator? And which stages of retinopathy benefit most? So DRS demonstrated that more than 50% reduction in the rate of civil visual loss in eyes treated with PRP in cases of PDR when compared with the untreated groups over the period of five years. It also recommended prompt treatment of eyes with uh, high-risk PDR. Then came up the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study. It was again a randomized prospective study and it answered a few questions. It showed that focal photocoagulation decreased the risk of moderate visual loss and reduced retinal thickening. Early scatter photocoagulation could be considered in cases of severe NPDR. And aspirin uh, has uh, uh, virtually no role. <clears throat> So these are some of the pictures of uh, pre-anti-Vegefira. So this is around 2004, where when we had patients with diabetic macular edema, we used to do uh, an angiogram, identify the leaking microanalysis, and then carefully with the area centralis lens, with a 50 micron beam, laser the microanalysis. And you can see here how these... Uh, uh, the edema has reduced. We didn't have OCT also at that time to show that the edema has come down, but patients used to recover, visual equity used to improve, and that is how we used to do it. For diffuse diabetic macular edema came the uh, modified grid laser, and then we had a typical grid laser which was done, uh, which was kept about 500 microns away from the disc. It was about 300 to 500 microns from the center of the macula, superiorly, nasally, inferiorly, and about 500 microns temporally. And this entire area was, <clears throat> was 500 to 3,500 microns. And it was shown that if you had a light gray intensity of burn, you could actually treat the microanalysms directly. And the distance between the burns was about one uh, burn width apart. And this did result and reduction of a diffuse diabetic macular edema. With the advent of anti vegf now we do not treat, uh, give laser to the central uh, part of the macula. Uh, center of involving diabetic macular edema is treated by pharmacotherapy, while a non-center involving or an extra foveal diabetic macular edema is treated with focal laser. Like in this particular case, you have a uh, the center being uh, flat, there's an extra foveal diabetic macular edema. So you identify the microanalysms. You should be able to differentiate between a microanalysm and a hemorrhage. And once you identify the uh, microanalysm, you go, go about treat, uh, treating them. And uh, one could use a green laser or a yellow laser, and it does well. I'll show you some cases. So this is a patient who is a diabetic for 10 years, hypertensive, has, is a non proliferative diabetic retinopathy with an extra foveal edema, visually equity of six, nine parts, was treated with, uh, uh, with an area centralist lens by a, a grid uh, photocoagulation, and the patient did well. So this is another patient who had a sarcinate ring, which was away from the center, the first thing which is important is to ensure that the patient gets a good metabolic control. 
Once you've done that, you can go ahead and do an extra foveal focal laser, which was done in this case. And this is four months after the focal laser was done. And this is about eight to nine months after the focal laser done. You can see how beautifully the macular edema has reduced. So this patient did not need anti-VEGF and responded well to uh, extra uh, foveal laser photocoagulation. When you have a patient with a high-risk PDR, you must follow your methodology of doing laser. What I do and what a lot of people uh, recommend is that you should treat the inferior half first, go about treating the nasal part superiorly and then the bodily. The reason for treating the inferior half is because uh, in case there is an accidental bleeding in these cases, then the, the blood will all accumulate inferiorly. And if you have already treated the inferior half with laser, you will still have opportunity to treat the rest of the retina with laser photocoagulation. So this is usually done with a mainster wide field lens. So we use the mainster 165 uh, and uh, we use a pattern laser. Like this is an example of a pattern laser being used. So you could use a mainster wide field, mainster wide field extra or mainster 165 lens. And uh, uh, a pattern laser gives you more spots at a single press of a foot switch. And each burn duration becomes shorter. Normally, it's about 100 to 200 milliseconds, but in a pattern laser, it's about 10 to 30 milliseconds. Hence, the total amount of energy delivered to the area is much lesser. There's lesser pain by the patient, and hence, it is safer. If we look at the change of laser burn in a continuous wave laser, which is what is seen here. There's an expansion of the laser burn. But in a pattern laser, you can see the burns are much more homogeneous, regular margins, and they don't expand like if we do a monospot laser as a conventional methodology. So the rationale of lasers in proliferative diabetic retinopathy is to actually convert a hypoxic retina to an anoxic retina which will reduce the formation of vascular endothelial growth factor. To be able to do that, one could use a slit lamp delivery system or an LIO, as we'll see here in this particular um, So the, <clears throat> those are the two basic methods of doing a laser PRP. Now here you have a patient with a horseshoe tear and uh, another uh, uh, tear which is operculated with a free floating uh, operculum. We go ahead and do laser with uh, LIO, laser and direct ophthalmoscope. Uh, you can give uh, one or two rows of laser burns around the break and you can see a nicely done laser and the horseshoe tear will stay there. What is important is to do laser in the area where there is no fluid so it should be done as soon as you, this is a very large horseshoe tear, it should be done. In fact, a patient walks in, you should tell them that it should be done immediately on that day, no postponement, no coming back and getting it dilated again. This is a patient who has got an atrophic hole in the temporal periphery. You can see this hole, this was lizard by LIO with two rows and the patient seems to be doing well. This is a patient who had an advanced uh, retinal detachment with PVRD3. Patient was operated. This is status post VR surgery, silicon filled eye, where a 360 degree laser has been done. You can see the buccal effect, and the patient did well. This is a diabetic patient who has had recurrent vitreous hemorrhages, underwent panthetal photocoagulation, and a vitrectomy and had subsequent bleed once more. 
And once the bleed subsided, cleared up, we did a few days exchange. We went ahead and did a wide field angiography and found it was an NBE. There were large areas of capillaries non perfusion, <clears throat> which were lasered, and the patient stopped having erectile bleeds. This is a very interesting case of a patient with a persistent diabetic macular edema, 61 year old patient who was diabetic for 10 years. Patient had been receiving antibiotic of injections. We did a wide field flush in angiography. You can see her NVE and large areas of capillary non perfusions in the periphery. Patient underwent panzetal photocoagulation. There was uh, treatment of the capillary non perfusion areas, targeted treatment of the NVE. Patient got stabilized, did not need. Uh, a recurrent anti of injections, and the patient was stabilized on laser photocoagulation itself. You can see the maxillary edema has reduced. The cystic spaces may not go away, but the patient is stable with no exaggeration of maxillary edema. If you do a lot of laser at one go, uh, you may end up having collateral detachment. So it's better to divide the PRP into different settings. We normally do it in two or three settings, but a pattern laser, you can actually do it in one setting or maximum two settings. Now, before I close, it's important that for the youngsters, it's important to know which lasers are available, what are the delivery systems, what spot size um, are available, single spot, multi-spot, continuous wave laser or transpupillary thermotherapy laser. You should be aware of all the possibilities that are available and make a judicious decision based upon the economy and what your needs are. So laser photocoagulation, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, was relegated to the backyard with the advent of pharmacotherapy, but now with better understanding and with better options of lasers available is making a comeback. PRP has uh, remained uh, effective for PDR over the last four decades, and it still remains so. Laser photocoagulation is the best way to treat focal extramacular edema, and laser photocoagulation is the best way to achieve retinopexy. So in addition to all this, we must understand that there are newer options available, like a subthreshold microfluidic laser, navelas laser, or a nanosecond laser. Now, I've been using subtitial micropulse laser. It's a very effective way of treating central serous retinopathy and macular edema due to many other causes because it helps us to restore uh, the site without being very destructive. So thank you for being there. Thank